I'm here today with Reverend Dr. Mel White. Mel and his husband, Gary Nixon, have traveled across the country speaking on university campuses, teaching the soul force principles of Gandhi and King, organizing people of faith to do justice, and confronting religious leaders whose anti-gay rhetoric, White believes, leads to the suffering and death of God's lesbian and gay children. In 1997 in Atlanta, Georgia, Mel received the ACLU's National Civil Liberties Award for his efforts to apply the sole force principles of relentless nonviolent resistance to the struggle for justice for sexual minorities. In 1994, Simon Schuster published Mel's autobiography, Stranger at the Gate, to be gay and Christian in America. That was 1994. Much has happened to Mel and Gary since then. Um, and on uh, February 15th, 1995, Mel was arrested for trespassing at Pat Robertson's CBN Christian Broads Broadcast Center. The story of his arrest, the 22-day prison fast, and the little victory that followed made news across the nation. Mel, it is such an honor and a privilege to be able to spend some time with you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my privilege. You're the man who's pioneering. I'm retired. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of retired too, but, <laughs> but you just have such an amazing story and you've accomplished so much. And, you know, uh, I really wanted to be able to allow, you know, younger members of the LGBT community to hear from you and, you know, gain um, the benefit of, of your experience and wisdom. So maybe we could start by, you can give us much more background, I think, and many more interesting things than what I just read. So can we start with, uh, with that? Well, my writing uh, is an accidental discovery, really. I was making documentary films for a living, and I called when the prisoners were coming back from Vietnam, I called the Navy secretary and said, could I interview one of them? He said, yes. I interviewed for the film, and it turned out it would be such a good book. So I sat down with the notes and wrote a book in about seven days, and it became a bestseller. So my first accidental book became a bestseller. It was really exciting. Of course, after that, it's been all down. <laughs> the, the, for me, writing has been, first of all, you don't say to somebody, you ought to be a writer. You ought to write. Guilt does not help. I had a friend who taught me in seminary who I thought would be a terrific writer, but I laid a burden on him by constantly saying, you should write this up, when that wasn't his gift, that wasn't his interest, that wasn't his talent. So if you don't have that talent, or you don't have that gift, you know, let yourself go. You have other things. Um, but if you have even the in slightest interest in writing, get a pen and pencil and start now. I was writing plays when I was in junior high school, and I've read some of those plays now, and they were horrible. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my son has just finished in a, a whole series for HBO that he wrote and directed and produced. That, that um, So I became a really lousy playwright, but he picked it up. And so now I'm living in his glory. But the things I've written, I've written because they were disposable. I, I thought there was literary and that there was nothing. I realized that in the middle somewhere, there's a disposable type. You can write for something. It's like a better than a newspaper story, but not much. But it has some kind of wallet for so many years. And don't need, you don't need to be up there with Herman Melville and Faulkner and the rest. Just enjoy writing about what you know. And so, so for me, right away, it was writing about the GLBTQ struggle. The church was just dumping on us a lot of misinformation and untruth. So the thing I wrote first for me was The Stranger at the Gate. I sat down and said, this is the way it's been for me. They told me I was queer. I was queer and sick and sinful and that I had to get over it, that God couldn't love me unless I changed. So I went out to change. And for 35 years, I tried to change through electric shock and aversive therapies and exorcisms and long nights of prayer and cold showers. I mean, for years, I was miserable, guilty, fearful, angry. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know the truth at all until finally one day somebody, you know, God, God got through to my head and said, I've given you a gift. Quit trying to give it back. You're a gay man and enjoy it. Enjoy what that gives to you. So 
I started this whole new world. And the first thing I wanted to do was just write what, what, what I'd gone through to help other people from going through it. That, that didn't take footnotes, you know, hate footnotes, need footnotes, but I hate footnotes. <laughs> My biography, I love to, you know, add some notes here and there, but, but I wrote it as a story. I had no idea I was a writer. And all of a sudden, it became very successful. In fact, it's been 30 years out now, and it's still selling through in Barnes and Noble and Amazon because it met a spe specific need. I got a long letter yesterday from Iowa, a boy in Iowa said, I've just discovered Stranger at the Gate in a used bookstore, and I've just finished reading it, and it saved my life. I'm telling you, I struggle with this. You just gave me the opening door. Uh, so, so let's back up for a second. Uh, so for folks that are not as familiar with you, so before you wrote that book, you were an evangelical Christian pastor and seminary professor, correct? Yep. So you were kind of considered to be part of the mainstream evangelical world. That was then. This is now. <laughs> right, right. So, so tell us about the reaction when that book came out. Yeah, I... I had been working because my kids had to get through school and I didn't want to come out and tell people that I was gay and lose all my income. So I ghost wrote for these celebrities who I thought were right about homosexuality. I mean, this was in the seventies and Jerry Falwell was saying gay is sick and sinful. And I said, okay, I'll be sick and sinful, but I'll write your biography for the money and get out of here. And when they read it, I got these great reviews across the country until the religious rights started reading it. And Jerry Falwell said, he's one of the best writers I know, but he turned against me. Um, it was a shock to see most of my friends dis disappear. Most of my colleagues, most of the people I'd done Christian films with, documentaries, books, publishers, gone. They wouldn't even answer my phone calls. Wow. And then this whole new group started by Phil Yancey and Janet who said, you know, we don't agree with you. We don't know what you're going through, but we love you and we're sticking with you. And little by little, a you know, few of these friends from the past nurtured me into the, into the present, into the future. So when you, take a, when you take a risk, be prepared to get slapped for it, but also be prepared to find there's a whole new community waiting for you to accept you, to love you, to buy your books. <laughs> Well, I mean, it took an incredible amount of courage, you know, for you to do what you did at that point in time. I mean, I remember 1994 pretty well from a, you know, lack of gay acceptance perspective. So uh, I'm you sure that. that had a huge um, impact at that point. It would be wonderful to think that it had. Um, I've gotten literally thousands of letters over these 25 years that I've had to answer that have been from people who said, are you sure that God loves you? as a gay man, are you, can you prove it to me? <laughs> and I say, you know, it's something that doesn't just happen. When did you finally, no, it was just gradually, I realized I was a stupid idiot that I'm trying to give back this wonderful gift. And God was just saying, come on, let's go on with the real life. Come on, let's go. And so when I finally said, okay, God, let's go. It was a new life. I mean, I've, what, what I've discovered, the adventures I've had, um, not a lot of not, un, not not bereft of faders, not bereft of terrors, but I tell you, coming out was the beginning of the beginning for me. And though I had, you know, 25 years with an amazing wife and have these two great children, I wouldn't have traded that for anything. So there was a trade-off in it for me, too, that I'm so lucky. And we're still a family now. We've gone to Hawaii together with Gary, my husband, and my whole family. I think Lila, my old wife, loves him better than she loves me <laughs> because I can't do what he can do. But no, for me, writing at the heart of it was has always been I get up and write every day, every day, every day, every day, every day. It, it, journals, that's the way to start. Don't go for publishing and don't go for publishing a series and don't go for publishing a scientific um, series on space age or something. Just write a, a letter, a paragraph, for example, a letter to your pastor, if you're gay, or lesbian, bisexual, say, you know, pastor, I can't come to this church anymore because I'm, I'm, 
I'm providing money to the persons who, sub, who subjugate me. I, you've got to get, oh, so you write a letter to someone who you really want to influence. And those letters, in Stranger at the Gate, I have letters to Billy Graham, to Jerry Falwell, to, I mean, all these letters that I wrote were, were very important for me because I got a chance to say what I was feeling, but it also gives you the chance to write. And as I began to write for them, other people wanted me to write for them because they, I, I, was a, I, I was a ghost. I'm a good ghost. I'll tell you why I'm a good ghost. I'll accept a contract and I'll finish it. Do you know that one half of the advances by publishers are never finished? Yes, yes. It's, and it could be more than that now. So I finished. I put my seat to the chair and I stayed and got it finished. So that made me, made me a, a great writer, but it made me a writer who came through. And that's what the publishers really want. <laughs> well, good for, you. good for you. So there's another book that uh, I want to talk about, Clobber the Passages. Could you tell us a little bit about that one? Oh, I love it. I have been arguing for uh, 40 years now with fundamentalist Christians who think that there are seven passages in the Bible that condemn me. And I tried to argue with them in Greek. I tried to argue with them in the meaning in Hebrew. I tried to go through the historical and linguistic context. I went, oh, what do these passages really mean? Suddenly I realized this is a false, a false argument. These people aren't interested in what they really mean. They're only interested because they're literalists in turning those passages on you and condemning you. I was on a 50,000 watt station radio in, in Seattle and the, the, the interviewer said, have you ever read Leviticus 20? Said, oh, yes, I've read it and I've been a victim of it. He said, well, what, do you, what does it mean to you? I said, well, what does it mean to you, Pastor? And he said, it means you should be killed. A man who sleeps with another man is an abomination and worthy of death. It should, you should be killed. And I said, okay, who should do the killing? Should you Christian folks come out of your churches and kill us? Oh, no. That's why we need to get more good men of God elected in the government so that they can kill you. Oh this is goodness. on a 50,000-watt station. Wow. But those literalists, you know, who read the Bible literally, they, they can't be changed. So when I went back to, to create Clobber, the passages, I said, no more. No more of this saying, well, maybe the Bible, maybe, maybe, maybe. I said, forget those passages. A bunch of fundamentalists, literalists got together and found seven passages that simply supported their prejudice. And they've been using them for centuries now to say you're bad. But not only that, have they, they, they say that passage says you're sick and sinful. And by the way, you shouldn't parent. You shouldn't be in relationships. You're a threat to the military. You're a threat to the church. You're a threat to adoption. And all of these little Many sins come out of those misunderstanding of those scriptures. So in Clobber the Passages, I said, this is how they got started. I was in the room where it happened. <laughs> and, and then they made all of these charges against us, so they're totally false. So I went about proving how we are excellent parents, how we are trusted as could trust and be good adopted parents, how we are great in the military. In fact, while I was writing... The first gay army chief of staff was, was selected for the Pentagon. I mean, it's changing, changing, changing. And I had to show evangelical pastors all across the country are saying we've been wrong. Evangelical theologians are saying we've been wrong. Gay choirs across the country seeing great theological stuff. You know, 75 to 150 men in Dallas singing in the Dallas Turtle Creek Corral. You know, Lead kindly light. I mean, there's so much evidence that not only are we not sick and not sinful and not should be discarded, but we're at the heart of culture and at the best heart. And of course, at the worst heart too. We do pretty good at our worst times things. I mean, but I, I haven't been tempted to go into drag yet and to try it out for RuPaul, but um, at 80, do you think it's too late? <laughs> oh, it's your call. <laughs> we, can't, we just can't, you know, we can't see ourselves as just good because we're gay. We can't see ourselves as just, we're cute because we're gay. All gay men are cute and all not. Anyway, what I've learned is that when you speak the truth, that's your truth, people will hate it or they'll love it, but they'll hear it. But if you're not speaking your own truth, it's a waste of time. 
So Prabhupada the passage is my saying, why did I try to kill myself when I had a wife, two children, uh, two, making $250,000 a year, a lovely home and a swimming pool, and wanted to drive myself into a, an abutment of a bridge? Why? Because those passages and the misuse of those passages had made me so feel guilty, so feel guilty, so feel guilty over the years that, and, and, and you know, suicide is so much more high, higher amongst high gay, gay guys than it is among the general population. And it's the second form of death in 14 to 25 year olds in the, in the United States now. Wow. I think that's before COVID. I don't know. But the suicide thing say, said to me, we got to stop this, stop this, end this stupidity. So clobber the passage and says, this is ended. I will not speak about these passages again. You look at the evidence. You see how we're, science is proving, the Supreme Court is proving, the military is proving, parent is proving. I mean, this book is just filled with the evidence that says those people are using those passages are, um, I can't use the word, but um, are full of it. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And, and they're so up, caught up in it that they can't let it go. So there's one other book that I'd like you to talk about too, Six Angry Evangelicals. <laughs> in 2007, I wrote a book called Religion Gone Bad. And I showed how that the major right-wing forces were using anti-gay propaganda to raise money and mobilize volunteers. And I studied it, man. I got all the de demographics of the money. And, and I simply said, they're trying to bring in a new kind of government, not a republic, but a, a real theology-based, Bible-based government that the Bible literally takes precedent over the Constitution. And so little by little, I showed how that the moral majority and the, and the Pat Robertson's um, Christian Coalition and, and gradually the Tea Party. These are all religious people. These are all fundamentalists led by fundamentalist evangelical leaders. These six angry evangelicals that start with Francis Schaeffer, who said, you know, the Bible must be taken literally. And I say, no, take it seriously. He says, take it literally. I say, take it seriously. Out of uh, Francis Schaeffer, and then Jim Dobson and Pat Robertson and all these guys. It's finally, it was a time to say, they're not just out to save us. Remember, I was an evangelical when I was learning to, 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 to share my testimony. And I had the, you know, the scriptures all laid out, Romans 1, da, da, da. And I would try to teach everybody about Jesus. All of a sudden, this new evangelical world is trying to teach everybody about Trump. They're not teaching anybody about the good news. Evangelical means good news. And these evangelicals are, are, are progenitors of bad news. And so uh, six angry evangelicals I wrote, it was called, um, it was called um, Religion Gone Bad then. I've just re-released it as six angry evangelicals to show the six people who were primary behind this turn towards fascism away from a republic. It's, it's such a shame, you know, to see what, you know, what's been done under the banner of Christianity. Well, my, when my son and I were on The Amazing Race a couple of times, the first time Newsweek magazine interviewed him, and, and he, he said, are you a Christian? He says to me, my son, are you a Christian? My son says, no. I thought, uh oh. And then they interviewed me, and I said, well, given my son's, what he understands about life, I'm not one either. The Christians now, I don't want to have anything to do with. So mark me off as a, of a mediocre follower of a first century Jewish carpenter. That's who I am. And I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. And we have something going that's so much more important than all of this political stuff that's bringing down the country and destroying the church. Isn't that the truth? So um, as you know, we've been doing this conference for spiritual writers, you know, from the um, LGBTQ plus community. What advice do you have for those folks that are just getting started? Great. I'm so proud of you. Yes, we have a whole new generation of writers that are coming up. And I just want people to know they don't have to be geniuses right from the start. They don't have to become the youngest poet laureate in the country's history. You know, just write a good poem. 
for, for me, it was just starting out. Organize, you know, I'm not a good organization. You should see Phil Yancey's library. Oh my God, he can just go back into history and pick out anything he wants. Me, I go to Google and pick out some things I want. And th there's so many different styles of writing and pick the style that you like best. I remember, probably you remember too, when we were no computers and I was, I'd go down to the beach and I'd type out on a portable typewriter and then cut up pages and put them, type them all, tape them all over the room. And my son still remembers coming into this room with this whole room full of papers. And then I would go around and say, this page would go with this page, this page. It was the, the early computer. You're right, right. I mean, and my son still says, Dad, how, how did you do that? Of course, how does he do it? He has 150 crew members in Maui shooting a film right now. And he's in the <laughs> whole So Michael, you, you, you tell them how you do it. I just say to the young writers, at the heart of good writing, for me as a Christian, a mediocre follower of a carpenter, is to have my own spiritual life growing, the internal stuff. Good writing flows out of good spirit. And, and good spirit doesn't come accidentally. I don't want to say, I used to have a devotional room. I had a Bibles and I did so many, you know, like you do when you're in high school, you have everything set up. I, I, I got undisciplined. And now I read great books that refer to great biblical issues or theological or philosophical issues. I watch great movies. I, I binge on series that just really inspire and inform me. Building your own spirit so that when you sit down to write, there's something in there that's uniquely you. And I think some people forget that we have to keep our soul full before we can become great writers. I think soul full is a very pro big, big, big problem with us. We're so busy. Absolutely. Absolutely. But then don't be afraid to write an article for Reader's Digest. They pay $1,700 or so. You know, that's very few words. Send it off. And I sent my first one off and they wrote back and said, well, We'd like to work with you on this article. You got too many big words and too many long sentences. <laughs> so they put me through a computer that, you know, for 12 year olds that brought that story down to the Reader's Digest level because people who can read it all, the, the Reader's Digest crowd are, are a, a good part of the Trump crowd. They're people who haven't had a lot of extra education and they love stories. And so I wrote about 10 stories for the Reader's Digest after that. And enjoyed seeing it published and enjoyed seeing a little money coming in. So do something to encourage yourself. I have a friend who was a Salvation Army guy, gay as a goose, but he writes good stories for the Salvation Army magazines. Now they know he's gay and they're letting him tell more and more of his story as he tells the story of these um, Salvation Army people who, who are, for example, the Salvation Army in his area goes down during the gay pride and, and has cookies and punch and things along the parade route. And they give that out. And, and to, to, that's, that's a kind of a spiritual gift to the people going by who are been rejected by their churches. And suddenly the church is out there in the line giving them good stuff. So <laughs> tell those stories. Tell those stories. <laughs> tell those stories. A lot of stories, you know, blogs are the way to go now. You don't go out to write a book. You write a, you write a book. You write a blog, chapter by chapter, and hopes people start reading it. And if people start reading it, publishers will then say, ah, you have a following. Maybe we'll help you get that published. Exactly. Exactly. There's a little, been a lot of folks that have taken that path. Oh, yeah. So many. So, Mel, um, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for all the work that you've done. You've been a leader, a pioneer, a beacon uh, for so many people. And, um, you know, I really appreciate you being, you know, a, a part of our conference and, and doing all that work uh, for so many. I wouldn't miss it. Les, I can't wait to see the next one. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks again for being with us today. I'm so grateful to have me. <laughs> Take care.